Mr. Schwartz will begin the program this morning, Secretary to the Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start out by first recognizing a number of distinguished people, and I'd like to start out by recognizing the 700 uh, self-advocates, providers, parents, and others who came and traveled to Albany today from all across New York State to come and get a briefing on uh, what I consider to be historic legislation that the governor is going to talk about later today. We want to first thank all of them for coming, and many of them are here in the Red Room today for this announcement. I'd also like to recognize a number of uh, our distinguished district attorneys. Today we have uh, Kate Hogan from Warren County. Derek Champagne from Franklin County, Sandra Dorley from Monroe County, Kathleen Rice from Nassau County, Richard McNally Jr. from Rensselaer County. I'd also like to recognize some of our commissioners and other members of the governor's administration. Courtney Burke, the commissioner of the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. Michael Hogan, commissioner for the Office of Mental Health. Gladys Carrion, the commissioner of OCFS. Arlene Gonzalez-Sanchez, the Commissioner of Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. Narav Shah, Dr. Shah, Commissioner of the Department of Health. Roger Bearden, Chair of the Commission on Qu Quality of Care and Advocacy for Persons with Disabilities. Mylon Dennistein, Counsel to the Governor. Jim Introne, Deputy Secretary for Health. I'd also like to recognize all the people in Mylon's the council's office, Jim's staff, and all the others in the governor's administration that worked tirelessly and hard on helping put together this significant and important legislation. I'd also like to recognize Senator McDonald and Assemblyman Ortiz, both chairs of the mental uh, hygiene committees in the Senate and the Assembly. And I'd also like to recognize Assemblyman Wiesenberg, who's been a long time, 45 year champion of this issue. Let's well, give them a round of applause. <laughs> you'll first hear from myself, then you'll hear from Clarence Sundrum, Special Advisor to Governor Cuomo on Vulnerable Persons. Then you'll hear from Assemblyman Speaker Sheldon Silver, Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelos, two very special New Yorkers, David and Catherine, who are here to share their stories about how today's announcement impacts them, and finally, Governor Cuomo. Let me start out by saying that today is a very special day in which our governor is announcing profound reform regarding the protection of New Yorkers with disabilities and special needs. There is no more noble cause and no more fundamental duty in government than protecting the health, safety, and welfare of vulnerable citizens. Today, Governor Cuomo sets a new standard. Today, we move to raise the bar. Today, we put forth a plan to make New York a national model. Today, we begin to right a wrong that has existed far too long with Governor Cuomo's proposed Justice Center for the Protection of People with Special Needs. The Justice Center will assume all the functions of the existing Commission on Quality of Care and Advocacy for Persons with Disabilities and be responsible for responding to abuse and neglect allegations for OPWDD, OMH, OASIS, 
OCFS, SED, and DOH. It will have an executive director and a special prosecutor inspector general who will have concurrent authority with district attorneys to prosecute abuse and neglect of criminal offenses against people with disabilities and special needs. It will create common standards for reporting, investigating, training, and discipline for cases involving abuse and neglect, and create a standard definition of what abuse and neglect means. The Justice Center will have a statewide hotline staffed by trained investigators that will receive allegations of abuse and neglect and ensure that these allegations are fully and effectively investigated and that those individuals who are responsible are held accountable. The Justice Center will develop a register that will contain the names of individuals found responsible for egregious or repeated acts of abuse or neglect. Any individual on that register will be barred from future employment in the care of people with special needs and disabilities. The Justice Center will represent the state at all disciplinary proceedings relating to allegations of abuse and neglect. A code of conduct will be established for workers who come in regular contact with people who have special needs so they are aware of their ethical obligations and held accountable to living up to them. This legislation calls for new as well as the strengthening of criminal penalties. And in an effort to increase transparency, this legislation will require that all non-state operated facilities and programs that provide services to people with special needs or disabilities provide access to documents based on FOIL for information requests regarding abuse or neglect of the people they serve. I'd now like to introduce Clarence Sundrum, Special Advisor to the Governor on Vulnerable Persons. Thank you, Larry. For many years, the problems uh, in the way in which New York State cares for those uh, with special needs have been well known. But in this area, as in so many others, Governor Cuomo knew that we had to undertake sweeping reforms. And shortly after he took office, he asked me to undertake a comprehensive review of state programs that care for people with special needs and disabilities. Today, I am pleased to say that this review is complete I have submitted a detailed report to the governor, which includes a, brief, a blueprint for how the state could better prevent abuse and neglect in the first place and respond to it when it occurs. My report found inconsistencies in the way in which the state's six human service systems regulate their services and set standards for the reporting and investigation of abuse and neglect allegations. These inconsistencies have exposed vulnerable people to a needless risk of harm and have complicated the task of teaching and training the staff who sometimes work in different programs certified by different state agencies. The report also found formidable barriers to reporting abuse and neglect by the two groups of people who, who are most knowledgeable about such incidents. These are the direct support staff who work in our homes and institutions and the residents themselves. To address these issues, the report includes a series of recommendations, including major reforms in the system for reporting and investigation of incidents of abuse and neglect, and training and support of the direct care staff on whom we rely to provide quality care to those who depend on them. The legislation and proposals that the governor is announcing today not only include many of the reforms that were included in my report, but I'm pleased to say that the governor is taking even bolder steps than those the report recommended. The Justice Center that Larry alluded to, uh, together with the sweeping legislative proposals, will help prevent and crack down on serious abuse of the vulnerable and would give New York the so strongest standards and practices in the nation for protecting people with special needs and disabilities. As most of you know, I've spent my entire career fighting and advocating across America and across the world on behalf of individuals with disabilities. From the work that I've done in other states over the years, I can say without reservation that these proposals are unprecedented in their breadth and scope and establish New York firmly in the forefront 
of reforming human service systems. I believe this legislation is going to serve as a national model. For too many years, New York State has not given people with special needs and disabilities the care and treatment they deserve. But I do believe that these proposals that Governor Cuomo is putting forward today, with them, New York will not only reverse decades of inadequate care, but will become a national leader in protecting vulnerable people. I want to take a moment to just thank the numerous individuals and organizations whom I've consulted with during the course of the past year as I've worked on this assignment from the governor. Without their input and their ideas and their support, the ideas and recommendations in my report would not be possible. Over 1,700 New Yorkers took advantage of the opportunity on the governor's website to send in their comments, to make phone calls and send emails, and their contributions have helped shape this report. In a very real way, the report and recommendations that I've submitted to the governor and the proposals in the governor's bill reflects their voices. Finally, I want to thank Governor Cuomo for the opportunity to be of service to the people of the state once again on issues that I've cared about deeply for all of my professional life. Thank you. And I'd like to now uh, introduce Assemblyman Speaker Sheldon Silver. Thank you, Clarence. Among the many duties of government, none is more fundamental, none is a greater measure of our character as a society than how well we care for and protect those citizens who cannot care for, speak for, or defend themselves. When abuse occurs at the hands of those who are responsible for providing that care and protection, the failure is profound. Last year, we in the Assembly conducted a series of statewide hearings to examine the abuse of individuals with developmental disabilities that occurred at group homes and institutions throughout New York. At these hearings, which were led by the Chair of our Committee on Mental Health, Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, we received testimony detailing a number of troubling cases of abuse and neglect that clearly demonstrated the need for comprehensive reform. We followed up our hearings with a package of legislation to improve the quality of care for our most vulnerable citizens and to better protect those residing in our group homes and institutions. As my colleague Assemblyman Harvey Wiesenberg, a dedicated and longtime champion of our most vulnerable, consistently preaches, much more needs to be done. The governor and his administration have inherited this crisis, and to his credit, the governor has outlined a plan to inject much needed accountability into the system and to eliminate its abuses. We support the overreaching goals of the legislation outlined today. The proposal crosses many of our committee jurisdictions, and we will work with the various committee chairs to ensure the issues are fully addressed. As we have learned over the years, the challenges here are complex, highly sensitive, and require substantial discussion that must include the governor, the legislature, advocates, and those who care for our most vulnerable citizens. That being said, and let me be clear about this, the vast majority of direct care workers are dedicated, compassionate people who are doing noble but vastly underappreciated work. The abuses we hear about and read about are not the norm. Still, they must be dealt with appropriately and thoughtfully and prevented in the future. We're committed to working with the governor and with our colleagues in the Senate to craft these comprehensive reforms that assure each and every citizen in the state's care is respected, properly cared for, and safe from harm. I salute you, Governor, for taking this issue to the forefront in this comprehensive manner. I'm delighted to now introduce <laughs> Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelos. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, just want to say when we walked in, Governor, uh, people started applauding. I said to the speaker, I said, isn't it wonderful that the folks here are applauding you and me? And he said to me, 
it's the guy behind you that's in it. <laughs> the governor just walked in. The governor should be applauded for that. Uh, because this is another example of government functioning at its best. A governor, majority leader, speaker, members of the legislature, uh, Roy McDonald, our senator, who uh, does so much in this area, getting together with advocates and saying, or our district attorneys, basically saying we're going to stop the abuse and neglect uh, of our most vulnerable. We did it a number of years ago when we enacted Megan's Law to protect our children against those who would abuse them, and we've seen many successes. And now the legislature, through the governor's leadership, is stepping up once again and saying there's another area uh, where basic human rights are necessary to protect those who cannot protect themselves. So it's my pleasure to join with you, Governor and Speaker, and my commitment to both of you and to all of you who are in this room that we are going to have a positive result, not tomorrow, but today. All right, this legislative session, we are going to get a positive result. My name is David DeShane, and I live in Tupper Lake, New York, with my wife, Joanne. Uh, we have been blessed with three beautiful children one of whom is David Jr., who was born with a congenital birth defect, which uh, have left him with a learning disability, seizures, and other health problems. Our son will be 51 in August, so he will be living in a group home at that time for 30 years. And I want to make this very clear that there has been many, many folks that have taken care of David over the years. and. They've been very caring and very good. But unfortunately, there are always ones that slip through the cracks. And uh, these are the ones that I'm going to mention. Uh, it left us with a lot of nightmares when we had this happen to us. Uh, it was a case of abuse and neglect. One caregiver uh, in the first group home that our son lived in it was not a state facility because at the time we didn't, there was nothing open to get him in and the doctors recommended that he move into a group home. He didn't want to live home anymore. So um, we got a phone call from the manager of this home and um, they wanted to have a meeting with us. So we, we said there was a person that abused our son and he was put out of work. So Joanne and I went down and uh, this fellow was turned in by two consumers, not one of his fellow workers, but two consumers. And the fellow was turning a ring over on his finger, a big stone ring, and he would haul off and hit my son on top of his head. And when he'd yell, he'd kick him in the shins. Uh, I always saw the black and blue marks on his leg and I couldn't figure out where they were coming from because David would not tell things, he would forget things. So when we found out what it was, um, they transferred this fellow out of that system and work, stayed working for the state, which was a terrible, gut-wrenching experience for us. Um, eventually, he, w he left the system, but I left, apparently left it on his own, and that, that was totally wrong. So you know how we could feel if something like that. And who, like I said, who turned him in was two consumers and not his fellow workers, which I believe they were afraid to do it because of repercussions at their job. Um, due to the severity of the conditions that uh, happened to our son, not, not from abuse, but just from um, some deterioration in his health, he was, uh, had to have a 24-hour eyes on. I mean, he was still capable, but he had eyes on at, uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, um, at one time, David was hospitalized with a severe concussion. I was called at uh, like uh, 11, 10.30 at night and said our son was on his way to the hospital. Uh, 
and he was unconscious. He had fallen in the shower. Uh, Joanne and I rushed over to the hospital in Saranac Lake, and uh, the doctor said he had a severe concussion. He had come around, but he was, he was hurt quite bad. And uh, I talked with the staff that was on. He said that he reached for a towel, and Di David went down and hit his head in the shower. Well, I, it was hard for me to believe that it happened, but there was nothing I could prove there. So it went on for a while, and then about possibly three weeks later, we had, uh, I was, went down, I'd go visit David every night on account of this one person that I felt was not a good person. And I walked into the house, which I was legally could do anytime I wanted to, and there was David, which he was supposed to have 24-hour eyes, 24 eyes on, was standing in the bathroom naked, and the fellow that was with him when he went down in the shower was standing in the front room, didn't see me, was on the telephone talking to his girlfriend. Now, he rushed up to me and went in the bathroom and continued on. I was shocked, but I, I didn't know what really I was going to do about it at that time. So not long after, we had a group meeting in the workplace where David worked in a sheltered workshop. And uh, the manager of the house got up and said that she was so proud of her staff. They worked so good. And there was a lot of people that were good. But this one person, I, I couldn't take it. I just jumped right up and I said, wait a minute. I said, my son has had a severe concussion back three weeks ago. This is not supposed to be left alone. I said, I walk in here and I find him naked. And I said, this person taking care of him is in the front room talking on the phone. So they automatically, the team leader called Supper Lake and kicked this fellow right out of work. And... Uh, the, the, the bad, same th uh, thing, bad, sad thing about it was he was not fired or reprimanded whatsoever. He, was, he bumped somebody else out and he moved into another position in another home. Uh, this is totally uncalled for, but it occurred. And um, so we, we continued on, and the, abu the abuse and the neglect that uh, our son endured was like 100% preventable. If, if the people that were working with him would have turned this perpetrator, I would call him, or whatever, in, but they were, they're afraid of their work. They're afraid of uh, what's gonna happen. I've heard uh, some people say, I turned so-and-so in, and the next morning they walk in the break room and they're shunned. Everybody's over on that side of the room and nobody will talk to them. And if they can get them, they will. This is what has happened. Uh, I think it is, some of the steps moved have been better, but still, these things should have never happened to our son. Uh, so that was preventable. And as for 30 years, I have done my best to make sure no one ever has to endure, endure what we have. Now that Governor Cuomo is taking real steps to reform this system and protect the vulnerability of the New Yorkers like David, who need the most help, I thank my family, I thank my friends, I thank all the members that did take good care of David, and I want to thank the governor and his crew and his staff, and I hope that everything goes through that we want to get done. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Catherine Cassio, and I was born on Long Island and now live in Albany. I would like to thank the governor for inviting me here today. Um, in 1980, at the age of 21, I uh, entered the mental health system. I was diagnosed with depression and post-traumatic stress disorder from childhood sexual abuse and violence. I was a patient in the system for 18 years. During my time in the system, I bore witness to and personally suffered both physical and psychological abuse by staff members. I suffered a broken pelvis from being over-medicated, I suffered a herniated disc and severe persistent memory loss from the effects of coerced electroconvulsive therapy, also known as ECT or shock. All of these treatments were given without informed consent. I was subjected to decrepit living conditions and experienced inappropriate sexual behavior by male staff members who I was supposed to, to, I was supposed to trust. I also witnessed the abuse of my peers. For almost two decades, I endured these abuses. 
I went through the system never knowing who I could talk to, if I could um, file a complaint, or where I could go for help to stop the abuse. That is why I was so encouraged to hear about the proposed Justice Center and Helpline. And I'm not just speaking for myself. Since 1998, I've been an advocate for people in the mental health system, and I've heard the complaints, abuse, neglect, and nowhere, and no one to turn to. Finally, we have a voice. I thank the governor for creating this bill, for pushing this bill, and helping out all of us who at times felt forgotten. I'd like to now introduce Governor Cuomo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me begin by thanking Catherine for that kind introduction and thanking David and thanking both of them for being here and sharing their stories. It's not easy, but uh, they believe it's important for them to share their stories so they can help others. Let's give them a round of applause for being here. To my colleagues, uh, First Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelos and Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, thank you very much for your words and your leadership on this issue. To the respective committee chairs, Senator Roy McDonald and Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, who have done extraordinary work uh, and great work that has brought us to today. Much of what you'll see in this legislation. Uh, was learned from the good work of the Assemblyman and the Senator. So I thank, want to thank them very much for their work. Uh, and Assemblyman Harvey Wiesenberg, I want to thank him not just for his work as an Assembly member, but as his work as a citizen and as a parent and how he's been a constant educator on these issues to all of us for many, many years. Please. <laughs> My team that has uh, worked very hard, as David would say, my crew, who's uh, done great work on this issue, Larry Schwartz, who you heard from as the secretary, Jim Introne, who's in charge of health and human services uh, for the state of New York, has done an extraordinary job. My great legal counsel, who is always being pushed to come up with a new legal theory, Mylon Dennerstein. And, Clarence Sundrum, who's worked in this area uh, for many, many years uh, and has forgotten more about this area than most of us will ever know. Uh, he's been at it so long that when he says Governor Cuomo, he's talking about Governor Mario Cuomo. <laughs> Clarence Sundrum, give him a round of applause. And most of all, I'm so excited that we were joined by 700 advocates and providers from all across the state who came up and got together on just a couple of days notice and came from every part of the state. It shows you the power of this issue, it shows you the relevance of this issue, uh, and it shows you how many lives have been touched. Let's give them a round of applause again. We have been working, my colleagues uh, and, and myself, to reform state government. And we've been doing it very aggressively over the past 17 months or so. Uh, I believe we've made significant progress, and we've gone area by area. We took on the issue of the budget and getting the state's fiscal house in order and getting a budget done and getting an honest budget done and getting it done on time. We did it last year, we did it again this year. We've been working on the area of education, and we've taken a very tough look at the area of education and how do we make it better, how do we make sure we're doing the right thing by our children. Uh, and we're now today discussing the area of human services. And I know I speak for everyone on this panel when I say that our goal is that the state of New York should have the best human service agencies in the nation, period. That's our goal. That's what we deserve. That's what this state has always been about, doing the best, the most innovative, the most creative, breaking new ground. And we won't rest until our human service agencies are the best, the best treatment. <laughs> the best in terms of treatment, new theories, new therapies, 
uh, we'll explore, we'll innovate, and we'll have the best. As a starting point, as a starting point, what every person who is in a human service facility in this state deserves, while we're striving for the best, there's a threshold that they deserve. They deserve to be safe. They deserve human dignity. They deserve to be treated fairly, free from abuse, be it physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse. These are people who are the most vulnerable New Yorkers amongst us. And they are in the state's care. They go to the state, their parents bring them to the state, their, their family brings them to the state and says, please help. And as a threshold, they deserve justice and fairness and humane treatment. And I am sure every citizen of this state joins me in this. You don't have to be an elected official. You don't have to be an expert in mental health, the mental health field, to say that every human being deserves to be treated fairly and with human dignity. And no New Yorker will rest until that is done. Now, we all know that for years, our state services have not been doing what they should be doing in this field. We've had some extraordinary cases that people have had to read about in the newspaper. We've had some extraordinary cases of abuse that ended in death, that, that ruined lives, not just for the victim, but for the family. There have been families that have dedicated their lives year after year to making sure other New Yorkers know what's going on and fighting and advocating for reform to change the system. This is not a new story. It's gone on for many, many years. It's an unfortunate microcosm of the deterioration of state government, in my opinion, over the past 15 years anyway. You can see this story in many functions of the state. It's just in this area where you're literally responsible for people's lives, the damage is greater. That's what this is about been recent articles in the New York Times that have also further exposed these issues. But enough is enough. People deserve fairness. People deserve justice. And that's what this initiative is all about. It's called the Justice Center because sometimes you don't need a lot of words. And this is one of them. It's a center to provide justice. We are very serious about it. And what this act calls for is the hotline is preventive measures. Also, a special prosecutor and inspector general that will have the sole responsibility of bringing justice to this field. Special prosecutor means criminal jurisdiction. It means if you break the law, you will be prosecuted. And a sense of immunity is gone. And our message is very clear today. I don't know what you did last week, last month, last year, but today is a different day. And justice is coming to the human, human services in the state of New York, and that's what the special prosecutor is going to be about. The role is also going to have, it's a dual role, special prosecutor and inspector general. Many of the actions that we're talking about today don't rise to criminality, uh, but they still are actions that require remedy and require sanction, and that's what the Inspector General will, do, will be doing. We're joined by district attorneys who are here today. I thank them for their attendance. I've been speaking with many district attorneys uh, over the past few days. I'm a former Attorney General. I was an Assistant District Attorney at one time. The job became too difficult for me, I want you to know, so I retreated <laughs> ultimately to being governor. Uh, but the district attorneys will have the same jurisdiction they have now. They'll have concurrent jurisdiction with the special prosecutor. They'll have someone to cooperate with, someone to collaborate with, but it's, 
We know how busy the district attorneys are, and we know how specialized these cases are, and this will be a special prosecutor who will be able to assist on these cases with concurrent jurisdiction. We recognize the rights of those employees who are unionized, and any table of penalty by collective bargaining, by the labor agreement, will be collectively bargained with the labor union to come up with a fair table of penalties. We also acknowledge, which has been mentioned several times, David mentioned it also, that overwhelmingly, the people who work in these facilities do great work and are great human beings and are great caregivers and provide excellent service at their own expense in very, very difficult occupations. And we thank them for their service and we thank them for what they do. We are talking about the exceptions, not the rule, but the exceptions need to be addressed and the exceptions are going to be addressed today. To my colleagues, we are fairly late in the legislative session. We have a few weeks left, uh, but uh, in truth, this is a complex issue, and it took us a lot of time to work through to come up with a program that we thought was comprehensive. Um, and I'm heartened to hear what Senator Skelos said. Time is short in this legislative session, but I believe we should make an extraordinary effort to pass this legislation this legislative session, and let's make it a law, because yes, time is short, but this is also long overdue. And people have been suffering for years in conditions they shouldn't be in. Let the, end, let the suffering end now. Let's pass this legislation and let's pass it this year. With that, let me thank all the participants again for coming up uh, and being part of today. We'll have a lot of discussion to do, and we have to inform the people of the state of New York about this issue. Uh, and I look forward to doing that with you over the next few weeks. I'll be traveling all across the state to talk to New Yorkers about this issue and how important this piece of legislation is so we have their support. To my colleagues who are here, thank you very much again. Speaker Silver. Senate Majority Leader Skelos, Catherine, David, Clarence, Jim, Mylan, thank you all very much. Uh, any questions on this topic from the press? We'll excuse me one second, let me just, Zach. Any questions on this topic we'll take. Questions off topic we'll take after a break uh, when we can clear the room. I think uh, both or all of the above, depending on how many factors you laid out. I think a couple of things are going on here, Zach. Number one, uh, it's the story we've been telling for 17 months, right? It's the story we've, we've been telling in this, in this room time after time after time. This is a state government where dysfunction is rampant, uh, where many areas of the operation uh, have, have fallen to atrophy. Uh, uh, and there's been a certain level of apathy, and you can see it, whether it's education or the budgeting or the economic development efforts. In this field, you have people's lives on the line every day. Um, I don't believe there was any one moment. I believe it was a slow erosion. Um, also, it is a very, very difficult task. You're taking care of hundreds of thousands of people, with difficult needs, over six agencies, with thousands of providers, not-for-profit providers all across the state. Uh, hard to attract a workforce, hard to train a workforce, hard to keep it consistent. Um, in terms of a prevention strategy, you know, that's, technology can help, but it's, it's an evolving matter. So it's all of the above. It's a state government that uh, hasn't been doing what it should be doing for a lot of years in a very difficult area that deals with people with uh, sensitive needs. You put that combination together and that's why we are where we are today. Do you know?
Larry, would you like to uh, It'll probably be upwards of greater than 400 employees. It'll be a combination of existing employees as well as a number of new hires from an executive director to the special prosecutor IG and so on. So the, the agency will be properly staffed to fit in the mission that the governor's laid out today. Well, I, first, I think, Bill, two things. Uh, there are preventive measures uh, in this bill that either Clarence or Jim or Larry might want to speak to. Uh, but also, you know, the, the old expression uh, is locks keep honest people honest, right? Um, without sanctions, without an enforcement system, you know, it's very hard to uh, have a, a operator system where people are following the rules in any setting. So I think one of the situations that happened here was the compliance and the enforcement was lax. You know, people knew the rules, Bill. It was a violation of the rules. It was a violation of the standards. And the standards and the rules, justice was often delayed. Uh, justice delayed is justice denied. The administrative procedures became very complicated and tedious and uh, overextended, and people start to give up after a while. So I think that's a big part of it. No, I don't, I don't think that's a, 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 any one agency. This is how do we approve the service overall? Um, how do we do it more efficiently? How do we do it better? How do we work across all six agencies? Um, so I don't believe it's any one agency. I believe it's endemic to the field. Any of my colleagues want to comment? Senator, Assemblyman, Harvey? Thank you, Governor. I really appreciate this minute. Uh, many years ago, uh, God blessed me with a special child, and Mother's Day is coming up, and I can tell you there are not more mothers who have dedicated their lives to the total care to give dignity and respect to their children with special needs. And it, it's interesting because no matter how difficult it is to have a special child and to raise that child, all I've got to tell you is because our child, Ricky, can't speak, never spoke, and all he has to do is smile, hold my hand, put his head on my wife's shoulder, and then you'll understand what happiness and what successful and love is really all about, unconditional love. So every parent and every family member are the real heroes who advocate for their children. I, did, I passed Jonathan's law with my colleagues. We changed the system then because we lost a 12-year-old child uh, who had a one-on-one, -on -one, the safest environment you could have with that child and he was killed because somebody worked 10 consecutive double shifts and was not capable of handling this child with autism, and he ended up killing this child. I can tell you because I have the history, my special child almost was starved to death, was scalded in a hot tub, had a broken hip when he never fell in all the years that we had him home and together. And then recently, like all the years that I've been advocating for families and working together with the governor and my colleagues, I mean, you couldn't believe at testimony that we were hearing how people were, were dying and, and they, everything was natural causes. There were no follow-ups. So we are, we're moving forward in this regard. But I really want you to understand that we have an obligation and responsibility to have dignity and respect and the care. Government has to take on. We went to Willowbrook and Wasse. We went through that. And the not-for-profit agencies, as the governor just referred to, have wonderful, wonderful people. My wife and I published a book. It wasn't for sale. It's the beauty of our special children and those who care for them. But I want to tell you, anywhere and everywhere, we have children with special needs. And they're amongst people who don't know the children. They, we put a face on these kids. They see the beauty and the love that permeates from these special children. And we can focus on what they can do, not what they can do. So today, we're here advocating. And I thank you, Governor, because I want to tell you, 
when my special child was abused and I went through the system like everybody else who called and told me what happened. DA's office, precinct, nothing happened. Can't get things done. And I just want to, I don't know if I should do this, but I, I just want to show you. Here's a report on my child being abused. You see this? Okay, that's all I can show you because it's adapted. You can't see anything other than the fact that my child was abused. So parents come to special led to our legislators and they ask for help. They came to the governor, the governor is responding. What we're gonna do is put it all together and get justice and make sure that people who abuse, neglect our, our families in every aspect because the governor expanded. I went on a small basis, basically with state agencies because I didn't think I'll have an opportunity to take on the world. Andrew's taking on the world here, the whole world of mental health and the people who are elderly and have needs, anybody with disabilities. So I salute you for that because you're going to accomplish a great goal. I just took one piece at a time. Jonathan Law was the start, and now what we're going to move forward is protect our whole society. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. And just, I love parents and families who dedicate their life to their children. But all I can say with Ellen and myself, that we get more happiness taking care of our special child than any other time and effort that's being involved in taking care of him. So thank you for being here, and God bless. Nice and safe. Nice and safe. Senator McDonald. Governor, I want to thank you a lot. I want to thank your whole team. I want to thank my leader and the leader of the assembly and my colleagues in the assembly. This is a critical issue. You said it all. We should accept nothing but the best, and New York's going to lead the way with your help and your leadership. I, too, like Harvey and Felix, have relatives in this situation. I can't think of a better team that could lead us in this moment. This is what the public wants us to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. All right, let me thank you all very, very much. We'll take a short break, and we'll come back for other questions uh, for those of you who are interested. But thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.